such a program. <laughs> Welcome back to Matt's Movie Nights, the show where we uh, where, where we watch films and I talk about them. Abbott and Costello <laughs> meet the monsters. So up first we watched Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, the first of these uh, Abbott and Costello meet monsters movies. Um, honestly, one of the very f earliest, uh, like, horror comedy films. Um, and honestly, I think it does a pretty good job blending the two. Like, it, it is... It's a monster movie. I think it works as a monster movie, but it's also an Abbott and Costello movie, and I think it works as an Abbott and Costello movie. Uh, there, there's a reason this has been held up as, like... <laughs> a prime example of, of, like, comedy blending with horror. Uh, in the story, a, a local, like, horror attraction has acquired Frankenstein's monster and the body of Dracula, uh, who are alive! They're, <laughs> it's not, uh, just two dead bodies they happened to acquire, they are actually still alive, which I, I, it seems like the horror attraction was not expecting to happen. They were expecting to just get two corpses that they could put on display, but uh, no, no, uh, Dracula and Frankenstein's monster are very much still alive. That is actually something probably worth noting. Uh, Abbott and Costello don't meet Frankenstein. They meet Frankenstein's monster, but that's uh, a pedantry that has been well worn over the years that the monster is not frankenstein frankenstein is the doctor but and and the doctor's not in this movie the doctor's not in this movie because the person reviving the frankenstein monster is dracula himself dracula has decided to control frankenstein's monster so he's the one responsible for it and uh in the midst of all this uh, Talbot, fuck if I can remember Talbot's first name, Talbot, the wolfman, shows up and is like, uh, Abbott Costello, you really gotta do something about these, uh, these Frankenstein Dracula guys, th th this is real, they're gonna hurt you, and, um, the movie ends with Dracula, Frankenstein, and Wolfman dying, and this is their last canonical appearances. This is this is the last canonical appearance of Universal's Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Wolfman. So it's just canon that Abbott and Costello were involved with the death of those three characters. They in this movie they work at a shipping yard. That's that's the setup. Abbott and Costello are shipping yard workers who are delivering. Dracula and the Frankenstein monster, and of course they get in trouble because suddenly Dracula and Frankenstein go missing. It's like, oh, you must have stolen them, and of course they didn't. They they were still alive. Um, I uh, mad props to them for getting uh, Bela Lugosi and uh, fuck, who's the Wolfman? Ah, uh, God, ah, uh, God, Lon Chaney, Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, they got Bela Lugosi and Lon Chaney Jr. back for this. Not Boris Karloff, unfortunately. Someone else plays the monster, but... Uh, they, they got two of the big actors back. Probably because they weren't doing much. This was, this was like the late 40s, so this was like nearly 20 years after... Like, those early Dracula, Frankenstein, Wolfman movies. Wolfman was a little later, but... Uh, the, this was a while after Dracula. This this is like just a couple years before Bela Lugosi starts doing like Bela Lugosi meets a Brooklyn gorilla and Ed Wood movies. <laughs> you know this this is not a a good time in Bela Lugosi's career. So uh, there there are commentators on this sort of thing who sort of suggested that this was like, a post-war thing, you know, like, before the war, we had, like, all the universal monsters, and we loved those, but 
after the war, we, we wanted something lighter. We didn't want, like, straight-up horror. But there was still, like, a nostalgic market for the, the Universal Monsters. So, Universal Monsters meet Abbott and Costello, you know? And I, I do think this film probably had something to do with the... the how do I want to describe this? The demystification of the Universal Monsters? Because, like, after this, you start getting stuff like the Monsters, where they're straight up using, like, Universal Monsters in, like, comedy projects. Like, they're not horror monsters anymore. Even, like, Hammer Horror is coming along and rebooting these franchises to make them, like, creepier and original you know they we're not doing like the campy universal monster horror this this is new this is hammer horror it's grislier i would have loved to see abbott and costello take on some of the hammer horror monsters this is just like a solid movie like they it's it, it's a idea i think could go south very quickly and we we are about to talk about two more intersections between uh, Abbott and Costello and some Universal monsters, and we'll we'll address how well they do. But this is just like the the perfect meeting of those two things, um, and it must have been fucking wild back in the day. Like nowadays, it's not that weird to just have like a horror monster show up in like some non horror thing, right? Like like. We live in an era post Freddy Krueger appearing on MTV. Like, if Freddy Krueger can host MTV, then Abbott and Costello can meet Frankenstein. Whatever. But back in the day, this must have been like, hold on, what? The comedy dudes are meeting up with Abbott and, Cost uh, Abbott and Costello are meeting up with, like, the horror monsters? So th th this must have blown people's minds when it came out, like... Oh, the, the comedy dudes are meeting horror icons. Not that that was a totally new thing. There were, there were like, parodies of the Universal Monsters in, like, Looney Tunes and stuff. Uh, Looney Tunes, the true pioneers of horror comedy. But this was, like, official. It was the official Frankenstein and the official Dracula from, from the movies. Showing up and, and fucking with Abbott and Costello. <laughs> like, it's it's a funny movie. It absolutely works as an Abbott and Costello film. And it's, like, a decently creepy movie with, like, accurate lore, honestly, for Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Wolfman. It's like, this this totally works for them. Like, I, I, I could easily imagine, like, a cheapened version of, like, Frankenstein, Dracula, and, and the Wolfman showing up in this. Because there was a lot of that, too. Like, after this, people... Because, you know, it's Dracula, Frankenstein, the Wolfman... It, it, Wolfman's not even based on a book. That's just, like, the old werewolf legend. Dracula and Frankenstein are public domain stories. You can just take those characters. So you get these, like cheaper imitations for, like, comedy stuff, but this, this works, and honestly, I don't know that I have much else to say about this, like, I just, it's a movie that I enjoy, no, nothing to dissect, no notes, it's, it's, it did a good job, it's exactly what it ought to be, like, this could have gone south very easily, and it didn't, and I think that, helped get the ball rolling on one of my favorite subgenres of film, the horror comedy. Because I think, you know, after this, I mean, Abbott and Costello obviously did a few more crossovers with Universal Monsters, but then you start to get people like Roger Corman, who are making films like uh, Little Shop of Horrors or Bucket of Blood, that are like comedy-tinged horror movies. And to be fair, I think that has been there the whole time. I, I think uh, Bride of Frankenstein is honestly a pretty funny movie. There are a lot of funny moments to Bride of Frankenstein. I don't think it is explicitly a comedy film where after this, I think you start to get people who are doing genuine horror comedy. So it, it is a pioneer in that respect. 
and it's an excellent movie. So that's me gushing about Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. It's a great movie. Please watch it. See, ironically, I, I have to take the big flippy thing out of the middle or else the, the, the case keeps falling over. But the one that's still in the case is Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. So, you, you know, you're looking at Frankenstein's face the whole time, but it's all, all that was sitting here was Abbott and Costello. So funny story, I forgot I was wearing my Neil Breen shirt today. And so I'm fiddling around with the camera to set up this shot. And I turn it to the front facing camera. And just the, the screen of my phone, it was just right on Neil Breen's face. And I'm like, what the fuck? Oh, oh, I forgot I was wearing my Neil Breen shirt. I'm just like, where the fuck did that come from? There's a reason I'm wearing this shirt. You'll see very soon. Up next, we got Abbott and Costello meet the Invisible Man. Um, in this one, they are detectives and they are hired by a professional boxer to prove that he's he's been framed for murder like he escapes prison and he's like oh i was i was framed for the murder of my manager because uh i was supposed to throw a fight and i didn't throw the fight like the mob was paying me money to throw a fight and i didn't throw it i won the fight so they came in and framed me for murder um of course he happens to be very close with the assistant to uh, a scientist who it's implied maybe knew Claude Rain's character from the original Invisible Man, but maybe it's just a totally different doctor who also made an invisibility serum, because that's like a decently common thing, actually. Because the obviously Claude Rain's character dies at the end of the Invisible Man, but then they have the Invisible Man's revenge. No, the Invisible Man returns? I think it's Invisible Man's Revenge. I forget. Uh, but in that one, someone else gets into his... That's the only, like, real direct sequel. Someone else gets into his stuff. But then there's the Invisible Woman, which is totally unrelated. She just... She meets this, uh... This doctor who turns her invisible. This other doctor who turns her invisible. And she doesn't even do anything, like, weird or creepy. She just, uh, like, fucks around with her boss... <laughs> um, it's, it's a comedy. The Invisible Woman is a comedy. And then there's The Invisible Agent. Less said about that, the better. So, maybe this is a totally new mad scientist who has developed an invisibility serum. Or maybe it's, uh, the, the, the professor from The Invisible Man. Because the guy who invented the invisible se invisibility serum is dead in this movie. So, it's like... Well, you know, maybe, uh, maybe it was the original Invisible Man. Probably worth noting, at the end of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, after, like, Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Wolfman have been destroyed, they're, like, rowing away in a boat, and then, like, you see this cigarette just come up and light, and, ah ha ha, it's the Invisible Man. He's like, ah, oh, pleasure to meet you, boys. And he's voiced by Vincent Price, who played... The Invisible Man in Revenge of the Invisible Man, or Return of the Invisible Man, whatever the title of the sequel is. So I, I think that sort of set up this movie, even though in this movie Abbott and Costello are playing totally unrelated characters. <laughs> so they have different names in in these movies. Uh, I, I don't remember their names in either of them, but I know they are not Bud Abbott and Lou Costello in both of these. Uh, they are named... Uh, Bud and Lou in this one, but they have different last names. Uh, and they're detectives. I went over the whole thing about the guy who turns invisible. And so... The way they sort of get in, they, they like go undercover to this boxing ring. And because the boxer is invisible, the boxer does all the fighting. They just, they put the gloves on uh, Costello. And they're just like, okay, just follow my lead. Do what I say. And then the, the Invisible Man beats up the other guy in the ring. Um, and so that's that's how they catch the mob and help bring them down. There is also, there's the suggestion that, like, the invisibility serum will make him go crazy. It, t it turned the last guy who used it mad. 
And so maybe this will turn you mad, but it, it doesn't. It never turns him that mad. I mean, he see, he seems a little weird by the end, but he kind of seems a little weird the whole movie. Like, he's a, he's a boxer who just escaped prison and takes an invisibility serum. That is not, like, a normal man. He, he's, he's a little out there already, so there's not that much difference between him, him at the end of the movie and him at the beginning of the movie. So, this is a better Invisible Man movie than most of the other Invisible Man sequels. The problem is, it's not a very good Abbott and Costello movie. Abbott and Costello are not particularly funny in this. A lot of the humor is just like, Ah, Lou gets beat up. Haha, -ha, it's funny. And that's about it. There's there's none of their like clever witty wordplay like there is in in the other two movies. I I think it's a pretty poor Abbott and Costello movie, but it works as an Invisible Man movie, which is weird. You'd think it would be the other way around. You'd think they would focus too much on the comedy and not make it like an interesting mystery. But no, it's an interesting mystery. It's just not very funny. So, I don't know what's up with that. Maybe they just took, like, an already existing script. Like, someone had pitched uh, an Invisible Man sequel that was basically this. Where, you know, the Invisible Man is a, a boxer who gets involved with these private detectives. And they're like, here, rewrite this to be about Abbott and Costello. Make them the detectives. But it's not really that funny. It doesn't really work as a comedy film. It's not really a horror movie either, but The Invisible Man was always one of the less horror monsters in the in the rogues gallery of universal monsters because you know, the original Invisible Man he he did do some evil stuff. There was some horror element to that. It's sort of him losing sanity as he's invisible and and using it to torment these people. But, uh, you know, you get to stuff like The Invisible Woman and The Invisible Agent, and it's like, you're, you're not even trying to be scary. Because there's nothing inherently scary about The Invisible Man. You know, Frankenstein, he's pieces of corpse that have been reanimated. That's creepy as hell. Uh, Dracula, he's a vampire, he sucks people's blood, his whole thing is killing people. That's scary. The Wolfman's scary. The Invisible Man... Uh, it really depends. Like, he can be scary, but at the same time, he's just a dude who's invisible, you know? That's a superhero. There are superheroes whose power is to turn invisible. So, like, Invisible Man could be anything. Anything you want him to be. It So, it, it's more of a mystery than a horror film. Uh, but it works. It works as a mystery. Does not really work as an Abbott and Costello movie. I don't know that I would really recommend this one, if I'm being honest. I don't think this is, uh, super interesting. There's nothing that really stands out about it, unless you're like a diehard Invisible Man fan, for some reason. Unless you're like, no, I gotta have that Invisible Man shit. Uh, it... it Okay, it's a decent enough Invisible Man movie, but if you're looking for, like, a funny Abbott and Costello movie, they have far funnier movies than this. And really, I feel like they are the main appeal. Like, it, that's why they're top build. Uh, that's why it's Abbott and Costello, but not the original Invisible Man. They, they didn't get Claude Rains back for this. Although, to be fair, canonically, he's dead. But they didn't get Vincent Price either. They got Vincent Price to say, like, one line for this. Which is too bad, because of Abbott and Costello meet Vincent Price. That'd have been a good one. The one I'm really curious to see, the one I really want to see, um, it was, it was, it was more convenient to get the Invisible Man one, and it also kind of made more sense because we had already talked about the Invisible Man. But there's one called Abbott and Costello meet Boris Karloff, the killer? <laughs> that's one I want to see. Because, uh, honestly, that's the thing about <laughs> the, these movies. All, all three of them, honestly, 
they do not pull their punches. They are not toning down the horror aspects to accommodate Abbott and Costello. Uh, in this next one we're about to talk about, Abbott and Costello just walk in on a fucking murder. That's the story, so... I am very interested to see Abbott and Costello meet Boris Karloff the Killer. Maybe we will watch that one eventually. There's another one where they meet kind of a monster. It's, like, tangential to this. Okay, uh... There was a TV special where they meet the creature from the Black Lagoon. That's it. That's all of the Abbott and Costello monster movies. It's 15 minutes. Look at that. And it's on YouTube, so... Yeah, it seems like... It seems like those are all of the, uh... Abbott and Costello monster movies. But, eh, I'm, I'm still interested in seeing that other one, so put a pin in that. Maybe we'll show that, or maybe we won't. Finally, we got Abbott and Costello meet the mummy. Now, the mummy is sort of an odd property in the universal monster canon, because... The first film is not really the one people think about when they think about the mummy. Because in the first film, the mummy is just Boris Karloff and he's like a normal dude walking around and speaking. But then you get the mummy's hand, which has the mummy as this like shambling corpse that's covered in bandages and moans all the time. And it's like, that has become the cultural ideal of the mummy, not... The original mummy. <laughs> so, this is more mummy's hand mummy. Um, although, it doesn't seem to be congruent with any particular mummy movie. Uh, unlike the unlike these other two, which are arguably continuital with uh, the, the particular movies that they are spun off from. This is... This is just Abbott and Costello meet a mummy. You know, it says the mummy, but it's it's just a mummy. Just a, a generic mummy. In this one, they are living in Egypt for reasons I am not entirely clear on. I think they might be delivery guys again, just like in the first movie. Uh, but <laughs> they're, they, they're living in Egypt, and... As it happens, uh, they, they go to visit this professor who's just uncovered this mummy, but, like, there's this alleged curse that comes with the mummy. Like, everyone who's sought for this mummy has died, and now, now I've finally found it, and I fear the curse is on me. And, of course, you know, he's discovered, like, the secret entrance to the tomb of some other... Uh, it's from like for like a, an Egyptian princess, which actually is taken directly from the plot of the original mummy, because <laughs> in that movie he is also looking for the secret burial site of a princess. So in this one, you know, they found another burial site of another princess, uh, and so there's there someone has put the head out on him because they want to find that tomb for themselves. And as it turns out, there's actually quite a few people looking for that tomb. Meanwhile, through mishaps... Actually, you know what? I take it back. I know exactly what they are. They're photographers. Because, uh... Costello accidentally takes a picture of Abbott holding the dead body. And that gets sent into the local newspaper, so... Now Abbott and Costello are charged with clearing their name of murder. That's the plot of this movie. Abbott and Costello clear their name of murder, and also there's a mummy running around. Um, so this one I don't think is as good as Meets Frankenstein, but I still really like this one. I think this is an underrated Abbott and Costello movie. Um, there's, there's plenty of good comedy to it, plenty of good bits. Um, plenty of... of fun moments. Uh, I guess it is a tad underwhelming when, when they face down three monsters and now they're down to just one monster, but 
I the story works. I think it works for you know them meeting the mummy, and I I think it makes more sense for them to meet the mummy off on his own. It makes more sense that the the mummy is going to be off in Egypt, where like Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Wolfman are running together. Because because if you follow the movies that precede it, you know you've got uh, uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, House of Frankenstein, and House of Dracula, where those three characters have all been hanging out duking it out with each other for three movies it makes sense that they're going to get together again in this movie and the mummy he's kind of off doing his own thing you could have inserted him into meets frankenstein but uh, why bother something that's a little odd is that meets frankenstein was directed by one guy i actually don't remember what the guy's name is but uh meets Meets the Invisible Man and Meets the Mummy were directed by the same guy, Charles Lamont. And it's weird that this one doesn't quite live up, but this one totally does. You, you would think, like, the two that work would be directed by the same guy, but... Or, or like, the two directed by one guy would both wouldn't work, but now one of them works and one of them doesn't, so... Whatever. Good, Charles Lamont... You made one, at least. Congrats. Let me make sure I'm not talking out of my ass here. Yeah, okay. Charles Barton. Charles Barton is the one who directed Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Um, something else that's a little odd about this one is... Like, they're credited as having, like, different names. They're, like, Freddie Franklin and, like, John Johnson or something. Uh, like, like... They're credited with names, but throughout the movie, they just call each other Abbott and Costello, or, or Bud and Lou, whichever. Like, he, uh, Costello does the classic, Hey, Abbott! So it's, it's like, yeah, they're just Abbott and Costello. Why are they not named Abbott and Costello? Why do they have different names when they, the whole movie, they call each other Abbott and Costello. That's always a weird thing with these, like, comedy duo movies. Because sometimes they're playing characters, and sometimes they're just named after themselves. Even when they're just playing characters, you know? Like, that that's uh, something weird about the, the Cheech and Chong series. Like, in the first one, they're not named Cheech and Chong. But in, like, most of the other movies, they are Cheech and Chong. Even when they're not playing themselves? Incidentally, there was an Abbott and Costello-esque pitch for a Cheech and Chong meet Jason Voorhees movie. Um, and it was, it was written by the guy who wrote part six, which is the best sequel. So I'm, I'm so angry we never got Cheech and Chong meet Jason Voorhees. I know it's unlikely. I know there was... Very little chance of that ever happening, but the possibility of it is so great. I just want Cheech and Chong meet uh, Jason Voorhees. It'd be so good. Uh, Evan Costello meet the mummy. It's a lot of fun. It's really funny. And the mummy stuff works because it, it does basically just lift the plot of the original mummy movie. Just with, like, this sort of side plot about Abbott and Costello kind of trying to... Abbott and Costello are trying to clear their names. Meanwhile, the mummy is happening. <laughs> and so they, they're swept up in basically just the mummy. Right? It's, it's, it's like the, uh... Because there were these two sort of goofy characters in the mummy's hand. So this is almost like the, uh, uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead of the mummy's hand. <laughs> like, the mummy is happening, and we're just focusing on these two goofy side characters who are swept up in the story. But it works. It's, it's a really fun movie. I think this one is super underrated. I recommend it. Especially if you're an Abbott and Costello fan. Now, I'm gonna admit right here... I'm pretty sure these are the only Abbott and Costello movies I have seen. I've seen some of their comedy bits. Like, of course I've seen Who's On First. 
you gotta see who's on first. I've, I've seen some of, like, their TV stuff. I've seen some of their comedy bits. I have not seen any of their movies outside of the three I am discussing in this video. So, this is the entirety of my Abbott and Costello movie knowledge. I don't know which ones are good, or even which ones are popular, really. Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein seems to be far and away their most popular movie. And rightfully so, it's a great film. <laughs> and and there's something just enticing about that. It's like, oh, a comedy duo meets Frankenstein. Fuck yeah. Uh, anyways, Abbott and the Costello Meet the Mummy. I enjoyed it. It's kind of weird the way they're written. It's It says Bud Abbott and Lou Costello meet the mummy. It's also, you can see it on the cover of this one a little better. It has their first names on there too. And usually in the opening credits, it also has their first name. And yet the, these movies are always just called Abbott and Costello meet whoever the fuck. Um, although on, on Letterboxd, Abbott and Costello meet... Frankenstein is listed as Bud Abbott and Lou Costello meet Frankenstein, but it's the only one that's like that. All of the other ones on Letterboxd are just Abbott and Costello. This says The Mummy, not Abbott and Costello. Abbott and Costello. There you are. Ooh. I own too many Blu-rays. So last time I asked you which horror monsters you would like to see Abbott and Costello go up against, that's a loaded question. I want to see them go up against... All of the horror movie villains, especially the really graphic violent ones. Uh, Abbott and Costello meet uh, Jason Voorhees would be great. And then, you know, you, of course you have to have Freddy Krueger in there. Uh, just just like you had Dracula in this one. And <laughs> maybe even... That's, that's the form... Jason versus Freddy versus Ash is gonna take. Ash is gonna have the role of the the Wolfman in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. He's just gonna show up and be like, "Oh, you gotta stay away from those two. They're bad news." Honestly, I I think we need like a new comedy duo in the vein of Abbott and Costello or like Laurel and Hardy, um, even like uh, fuck. Oh, what were those two guys' names? Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin. Mar Mar Martin and Lewis. We need a new Martin and Lewis. Now, now my pitch to keep it exciting this time is that they're gonna be gay. That's it. That's that's my only pitch. Actually, there's a pretty funny recurring gag <laughs> across all three of the Abbott and Costello movies we watched. In all three of them, it's like a recurring gag that like women are just attracted to Costello. And, like, Abbott will, like, like Costello's totally oblivious to it, and then Abbott will swoop into, like, oh, hey, lady, and they're not interested in him. They're only interested in Costello. So that's a, I think that's a funny gag. And it keeps happening. It keeps happening in all the movies. I love that it's consistent. Uh, anyways, the answer I got from John August was, I'd love to see Abbott and Costello go up against Pinhead. Absolutely. fucking lootly Pinhead. When when I was talking, just to say, I, I, I didn't say Pinhead just because I knew John August had picked Pinhead. So I'm like, yeah, because that's like, like the really fucked up shit, right? Hellraiser is like even more fucked up than like the, the Nightmare on Elm Street Friday the 13th stuff. So it's like, yeah, put, put Abbott and Costello up against these really fucked up characters. And Pinhead kind of works because... Pinhead's not really a villain per se. He's usually going against people who have explicitly... Well, I mean, he, he goes after people who've opened the box, right? And, and usually he's going after someone bad, right? So I think it's... <laughs> It's very possible to do, like, an Abbott and Costello bit where, like, one of them acts, like, Costello, obviously. Costello would, like, maybe accidentally open the box and unleash Pinhead, and then he would try to play it off like, uh, oh, Abbott's the one who opened it. Or maybe even someone else opens the box and then tries to pin it on Abbott and Costello. <laughs> That's, hmm... I'm making a note here. I'm gonna come up with a pitch for this movie. For Abbott and Costello meet Pinhead. I, I, I'm... 
writing it. It's it's there. I have a pen in this. I'm gonna write this. And uh, actually, we're watching a movie tonight that features another creature. It would be funny to see Abbott and Costello go up against. Uh, but we'll get to that when we get to that. My question for you tonight is, what's your favorite Arnold Schwarzenegger movie? But that isn't a Terminator film. Because if I don't specify not a Terminator film... Okay, not the first two Terminator films. If you want to make an argument for any of the sequels, feel free. Not the first two Terminator films. Uh, too obvious. What's your favorite Schwarzenegger film that isn't Terminator or Terminator 2? Because tonight I'm doing an Arnold Schwarzenegger triple feature... Uh, in a desperate attempt to bump up the body count of this year. Because this is the last week of year two. After, after this week, we will have done two years of Matt's Movie Nights. Uh, and I'm trying to get my body count up because it's actually been pretty low. Because these fucking Universal movies have pretty low body counts, actually. So, tonight, we're starting off with Commando. <laughs> the movie where Schwarzenegger kills, like... 500 people. This this is gonna boost that number a lot. I love Commando. I should probably also note, I usually try to throw in at least one movie I've never seen before, except we did a couple in a row back there where I hadn't seen any of them. Like the, the Lady Street Fighter series, I hadn't seen any of those. So this is three movies I have seen to try to make up for that. Starting with Commando... Then we're going to do the lovely and infamous Predator. And can't you just see Abbott and Costello versus the alien with the Predator coming in to be like a side character? Perfect. Abbott and Costello meet the alien and Predator. And finally, we're going to watch Total Recall. Now, I actually recall this one having a... a recall. Haha. <laughs> recall this one having a decently low body count, so this might not be the best pick, but... Fuck you, it's my favorite Schwarzenegger movie that's not one of the Terminator films. And until next time, I'm Matt. Have a nice day.